It was a cold and misty morning on April 10, 1741. The 28-year-old Prussian King Frederick II looked at the small town of Morwitz in the province of Silesia. Together with his near 22,000 strong army, he managed to use the cover of darkness and fog to creep up on the Habsburg forces quartering nearby. Judging by the campfires and the lack of movement, they had no idea a larger force was moving in on them. Frederick ordered his soldiers to take up positions and take their battle lines. His right-hand man, the experienced Prussian general Kurt von Schwerin, warned Frederick, if he deployed his army in a battle line, the element of surprise would be long gone. Frederick did not heed his warning, despite repeated pleas from his officers. Many years later, when reflecting on this battle, Frederick conceded he should have listened to them. It would be a costly mistake, but alas, the Battle of Morwitz, Frederick the Great's baptism of fire, was about to commence. Ever since the Treaty of Westphalia concluding the Thirty Years' War in 1648, the Holy Roman Empire had been a shadow of its former self. It was a patchwork of states, dominions and duchies, with German princes attempting to seize as much power as possible. Over the years, the two ancient European powers, Austria and France, were joined by Britain and Russia, with Poland, Spain and the Ottoman Empire in decline. Holland and Sweden were unable to maintain themselves among the European giants. In October 1740, the Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI died without a male heir. Before his death, he had issued the Pragmatic Sanction. This meant so much as that the Habsburg hereditary territories were allowed to pass to a woman, his daughter, Maria Theresa. Yet, internal strife in Austria led to a weak and divided empire. Austria had just participated in the War of the Polish Succession and concluded a poor peace with the Ottomans. But it wasn't just the Austrian Habsburgs who were in an unstable position. For example, in Russia, Tsarina Anna passed away and factions at court fought over control as her infant son, Ivan VI, succeeded her. The British were preoccupied with the war against Spain and France was eager to weaken its arch rival, the Habsburgs. As soon as Maria Theresa ascended to the throne, several European monarchs broke their promise of recognizing her. Meanwhile, within the turbulent European theater, one young king did not plan to play by the rules. In May 1740, King of Prussia Frederick William I passed away. Known as the Soldier King, he spent his entire reign expanding his army, dedicating the crown's revenue to drilling and improving his force. When he died, his 27-year-old son Frederick II succeeded him. He inherited a well-disciplined, modern and relatively massive army, including a comfortably stocked war chest. Their healthy finances contrasted Prussia with the less-than-ideal finances of the electorates of Bavaria and Saxony. Their subsequent rulers spent heavily on palaces, ceremonies and securing titles. Saxony's elector Augustus III doubled as Poland's king and Lithuania's Grand Duke. Meanwhile, despite the electorate's troubled finances, Bavaria's elector Charles Albert contested Maria Theresa's husband Francis of Lorraine's claim as the Holy Roman Emperor. Being an elector and thus being able to cast an imperial vote, Frederick figured he shouldn't trade his vote for free. To make sure he played both sides, he assured Bavaria's elector that he supported his claim to the throne, albeit covertly, so he could also bargain with Maria Theresa if she turned out to have the upper hand. As such, the young king seeking to prove himself found himself in an incredibly favorable position. The geopolitical balance in Europe was quite uncertain, with all major powers preoccupied with other problems. So when Frederick learned of Bavaria lodging claims to the Habsburg inheritance and the Saxons following suit, he knew he had to act fast if he wanted to enter history books. And if we believe Frederick's writings, his motive indeed was that simple. In his own words, the satisfaction of having my name in the journals and later in history seduced me. A logical target would be Silesia, yielding the most tax from Habsburg lands. Moreover, it was one of the most industrialized areas at the time. Using the infrastructure his father left him, he mobilized his entire army much faster than any other European state could. To sketch a timeline, in October, Frederick learned of the emperor's death, and by December 16, 
his armies crossed the Silesian border. It was an unprovoked and unexpected attack of a minor player against the leading dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire and great power. There were barely any Habsburg troops stationed there, 4,000 at best. By January 17, the entire province was his, except for a few fortresses, among them Brieg and Neisse. All the while, Frederick engaged in active and energetic diplomacy with the ministers at home, European courts, and even with Vienna. Upon hearing of Frederick's callous invasion, the entire Habsburg court responded with shock, horror, and anger. Maria Theresa sent an army numbering approximately 20,000 under Wilhelm Reinhard von Neipen to retake Silesia via Moravia. There was nothing but contempt for Frederick's obscene actions. Neiper caught the inexperienced Frederick sleeping. Rapidly advancing via the west, he relieved the besieged fortresses of Neisse, marching onto Breslau. Neipper's positioning cut Frederick off from the kingdom, headquarters and supply lines. Frederick now had to hurry back to prevent Neipper from cementing his position. A race between both armies emerged trying to reach the other first. Frederick received valuable intelligence, however. Several captured Austrian soldiers revealed Nypark's position nearby the village of Molwitz. Thanks to the fog and slight drizzle, Frederick's army could close in on Nypark's camp without them noticing. What followed was one of the most evident signs of Frederick's inexperience. Instead of using the element of surprise, he took his merry time deploying his army in a battle line doing everything by the book. Additionally, he miscalculated the distance of a river close by, deploying several units behind a bend and others at a 90 degree angle from his main battle line. While all this was going on, Neiper pulled on. His soldiers were cooking food and mainly facing the wrong direction. They were spread over the villages of Molwitz and Grüningen. Panicked, he deployed his entire army. Thanks to having their guard down, this took over an hour. And thanks to Frederick taking his time, he allowed his enemy to position themselves in a proper battle line. Regarding the army composition, the Prussians enjoyed multiple advantages. The Austrians commanded some 19,000 troops, whereas the Prussians fielded 21,600 men. Furthermore, they utilized an iron ramrod a novel way to increase the firing frequency of their flintlock muskets. As a result, the Prussian infantry fired up to three times more rapid than the Austrians. In addition, Frederick's late father drilled the Prussians, making them renowned for their discipline. In contrast, many of the Austrians were recently levied recruits. Frederick's infantry and artillery outnumbered the Austrians. However, the Austrian cavalry outnumbered the Prussians 2-1 the Austrians positioned their army in one long line with cavalry on its flanks. Meanwhile, Frederick himself manned the right flank of his army, consisting of a mixed cavalry infantry contingent. The two center lines consisted of the Prussian infantry. On the left stood the heavily outnumbered Prussian cavalry. At around 2 p.m., Frederick ordered his artillery to open fire and his two center lines to advance onto the enemy positions. This was Frederick's first serious experience of battle. Several shells impacted the Austrian left flank, where up to 5,000 horsemen were stationed. Understanding they were under fire, they took the initiative, and without waiting for orders, they decided to launch a charge against the Prussian cavalry. The latter didn't attempt to counter the charge, despite a numerically superior Austrian force now charging them head-on. When both parties collided, the damage inflicted on the Prussians was significant. It didn't matter, Frederick was among them, many of the Prussians devolved into a rout. Eyewitness accounts describe Frederick to behave with incredible courage, more than once risking his life with near indifference, but it didn't change a thing. With the Prussian cavalry crumbling and fleeing, the right flank of the center infantry lines was now exposed. Part of the Austrian cavalry charged into them. The situation appeared rather grim, if not hopeless, for the Prussians. The battle had only just begun and they lost control of the battlefield entirely. General Kurt Christoph Graf von Schwerin urged Frederick to leave. The king, appreciating his less than favorable situation, heeded this warning. He fled to the east with his cavalry unit, nearly being caught in the process. With Frederick gone, Schwerin, a veteran general, took over command. 
No matter his experience, Trevin had a rather daunting task cut out for him. By now the Prussian cavalry was entirely scattered and the Austrian cavalry was making serious inroads against the Prussian infantry, launching constant charges against them. There were no rare instances of friendly fire from the second line against the first line either, but the Prussian infantry held firm. They continued firing volleys against and engaging in close combat with the Austrian cavalry. They killed their commander and caused significant casualties. When the Austrian infantry regiments tried to join the fight and relieve pressure from the cavalry, they suffered the brunt of the Prussian lines firing volleys at an incredible pace. After a while, the Prussian infantry finally managed to fend off the Austrian cavalry. Subsequently, Schrerin ordered the surviving infantrymen to loot the ammunition from the slain soldiers. He concentrated the majority of the Prussian infantry on his right flank. Then he ordered the right flank forward. The left flank received the same order shortly after. The Prussian bulwark advanced, stopping in between the marching, only to fire at the enemy. They swiftly repelled a hesitant charge by the Austrian right flank cavalry. An Austrian survivor recounted the moment. The enemy army now advanced from all sides. They enjoyed a numerical superiority of up to 3,000 men. They overlapped us on both flanks. I can safely say that never in my life did I see anything finer. They marched forward with the greatest steadiness, with their lines as straight as a die, as if they were on the parade ground. Their polished weapons glinting in the sunlight made a stunning impression, and their volleys were like a constant roar of thunder. Our army became completely demoralized, our infantry could no longer be kept together in their ranks, and our cavalry no longer had any wish to form up against the enemy. The Prussian right flank was the first to reach the Austrians. Besides firing, the front lines engaged in heavy close combat. Brutal fighting spread along the entire Austrian line. This went on for a time as the Prussian left joined in soon after. The Austrian left was the first to break. As they saw their fellow soldiers flee the battlefield, the other soldiers too broke rank and abandoned the battlefield. Nyperg understood they were losing momentum. It would be challenging, if not impossible, to emerge from this situation victoriously. By the late afternoon, Nyper ordered the official retreat. Lacking cavalry and because the night set in, the Prussians decided not to pursue the Austrians. Instead, Schrerin sent a messenger to Frederick to notify him of the victory. The Austrians retreated to Neisse and the Prussians laid siege to Brieck and they captured it on May 4th. Frederick made several mistakes during the battle, which he agreed to in a self-critical battle account. Despite this, letters he sent to his ministers and close relatives in the direct aftermath omit Schrerin's rule in the battle entirely. His leaving of the battlefield could have multiple reasons. The most straightforward conclusion to draw was that Frederick fled, although many primary sources and subsequent historical analysis agree he showed great courage during the battle itself. He likely left upon repeated pleas by General Schrerin. But in any event, the new Prussian king managed to challenge one of Europe's greatest dynasties and emerge victoriously. In that regard, the victory at Molwitz ensured Frederick's name traveled to all European courts. Despite not being in command himself and the triumph largely having been achieved thanks to the discipline of his forces instilled by his father, it was a victory nonetheless. And the young king made sure he learned of his mistakes. He set up a grueling training regimen for his cavalry to never again be unprepared. He rose before dawn and drilled throughout the day. Naturally, he expected his officers and soldiers to do the exact same. Molwitz would not be the final battle between the young king and the Habsburgs. If anything, as Thomas Carlyle put it, Molwitz was the loose pebble precipitating an avalanche. The First Silesian War and the War of the Austrian Succession had only just broken out. On the evening of May 16, 1742, Frederick II, King of Prussia, and his 10,000 strong army set up camp somewhere in Bohemia. The men lit their campfires and began cooking, while Frederick talked strategy with his officers. Then a messenger suddenly entered his camp. His horse, out of breath, he handed Frederick a letter written by his general, marching with the remainder of his army around one day's march behind him. 
The day before, Frederick passed a minor Austrian encampment nearby the town of Chotusitz. Thinking nothing of it, he continued his march. This letter, however, revealed the encampment they passed wasn't minor. It housed a 28,000-strong Habsburg army chasing Frederick. His general urged him to turn around immediately, as there was no doubt in his mind his army would face battle at the break of dawn. After Frederick's victory at Molwitz, news traveled fast to all European courts. The small, insignificant Prussia managed to take on one of the greatest European dynasties. And they won. In the direct aftermath, Molwitz led to a chain of events resulting in the war of the Austrian succession. Planning rights, a period of diplomatic activity followed. Every power participating in the subsequent war had different interests. In short, the Habsburgs wanted to reclaim Silesia. Frederick wanted international recognition for his conquest of Silesia, and especially not his fellow electorates of Saxony and Bavaria to gain anything at his expense. The interests of other powers were a bit more complex. Bavaria wanted its elector to become Holy Roman Emperor, and Saxony wanted to take whatever territories it could to link Poland-Lithuania with its electorate. France wanted to prevent Maria Theresa's husband from becoming Holy Roman Emperor, preferably while reducing the Habsburg dominions to a second-rate power. In May, Bavaria and Spain, with the support of France, signed the Treaty of Nymphenburg. The treaty agreed to support the Bavarian elector's candidacy as Holy Roman Emperor. Later, Savoy, Piedmont and Saxony joined the alliance. Finally, Prussia joined on June 4th, with France agreeing to send two French army corps, one to aid Prussia, one to invade Bohemia. Still, Frederick wanted Silesia, but he knew he would not benefit if Maria Theresa's lands were improperly dismembered. As such, he joined the alliance with a significant dose of suspicion. Despite his allies preparing for war, Frederick enjoyed a relatively quiet summer, welcoming reinforcements and, at best, enduring some cavalry skirmishes against Hungarian hussars. Then in August, the French army corps arrived. Contrary to Frederick's expectations, namely marching them to Vienna, a combined French-Saxon-Bavarian army focused on conquering Bohemia to secure the electoral vote for Charles of Bavaria. Frederick's allies didn't know that Frederick concluded a secret truce with General Nyperg on October 9th. The Habsburgs were in a desperate situation, losing ground every day. Frederick did not want to lose face towards his allies. As such, both parties concluded a verbal truce which stopped Prussia from making war without appearing to have stopped making war. Within a few months, Frederick had already betrayed his alliance, and it would not be the last time. In November, a combined French-Bavarian-Saxon army captured Prague. One month later, Charles was crowned King of Bohemia. Then, securing this electoral vote, he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in January 1742. Prussia had been relatively dormant during these developments. Realizing his allies were taking control of the situation, Frederick decided breaking the truce would be worth it to cement his position. In December, he invaded Bohemia and captured Tropau and Ulmutz. He betrayed Maria Theresa a second time. He rationalized it by stating the Austrians in fact broke the truce by leaking its existence to certain parties. Though things went well for Frederick for now, his allies faced tougher challenges. In January, a fresh army levied in large part from Hungary and Croatia under Field Marshal Count Ludwig Andreas Kevenhuller was determined to drive out the Habsburg enemies. From Vienna, he marched to Linz where he defeated the French General Segur. They continued their march west, capturing Munich, banning rights. In a twist of irony, the Bavarian elector was crowned emperor on that day in Frankfurt am Main. The first among European sovereigns had no state, no army, and no resources. In the background, Frederick continued securing his hold on Silesia by defeating some defiant Austrian garrisons before marching into Moravia together with a 20,000 strong Saxon army. However, when they reached Brno, the Saxons refused to go any further. Their refusal was one of the many reasons Frederick referred to when publicly badmouthing his allies on many occasions. It would not bode well for the future. The constant harassment of supply and communication lines by Hungarian hussars and local irregulars led Frederick to try and squeeze the province as dry as he could before setting up his headquarters at Krudin, 
Facing hard times, Frederick reached out to Maria Theresa to see if she would be willing to accept another pact of neutrality. Considering his earlier violations and his callous invasion to begin with, she would not be fooled a third time. Sources conflict whether Maria Theresa sent an army to recapture Prague or to root out Frederick specifically. At any rate, in April, Austrian troops stationed in Bohemia received orders to link up with an army advancing through Moravia, fielding an approximately 28,000 strong army under the commander Charles of Lorraine, they marched in Frederick's direction. Correspondence reveals Frederick was in the dark for the majority of the operation. It wasn't until May 10th he realized a powerful Austrian army marched in his direction. So he decided to split his army into two, taking them north. Frederick took 10,000 soldiers, while one day behind them followed 18,000 more under Leopold of Anhalt Dessau, son of Frederick's mentor, the old Dessauer. Frederick and Dessau figured they traveled far in advance of the Austrians. Then on May 15, Frederick passed an Austrian encampment near the village of Chotusitz. He didn't think much of it. One day later, near Chotusitz, Dessau's rearguard engaged in a minor skirmish with Austrian cavalry. The experienced commander understood it wasn't just a random encampment or skirmish. It was, in fact, Charles's entire army. Respecting the danger he was in, Dessau ordered his men on a grueling march towards Frederick to bridge the camp. He sent out several horse riders with the urgent message for Frederick to turn around and march towards him. That night at 2 a.m. his exhausted army occupied Chotusid, a small bohemian village. Riders returned with Frederick's reply, Dessau, was not to engage under any circumstances until Frederick arrived. Dessau commanded up to 18,000 Prussian infantry. He deployed his men to the south of Chotusitz. He positioned his cavalry on both flanks, with his left flank commanded by Lieutenant General von Waldorf. In front of the Zirkwitz pond on his far right stood 70-year-old Lieutenant General von Budenbrock. The cavalry consisted of heavy cuirassiers, dragoons and light hussars. The positioning was done on purpose so that once Frederick arrived, he would find room to deploy his infantry. The infantry was comprised of both grenadiers and light infantry. Charles wanted to mount a charge before Frederick could deploy his army. Before dawn, he already deployed his infantry in two long lines in the center, flanked by two sizable cavalry contingents. The Austrian infantry wore the characteristic white coats with lapels, a tricorn hat equipped with muskets, bayonets and small swords. The Austrian cavalry consisted of Hungarian hussars and traditional heavy Austrian cavalry. The left was commanded by General Karl Bacciani and the right by Wenzel, Prince of Liechtenstein. Before 7 a.m. Charles ordered his infantry lines to begin their march forward. Frederick and his 10,000 soldiers arrived around 7 a.m. A large body of Austrian soldiers advancing in the distance welcomed him. The Austrian artillery fired away at the Prussian positions, but the Austrians had no idea the king arrived. A large mound between Chotusitz and the Zirkwitz pond blocked their view. Still, Frederick felt he would not be able to properly deploy his army in time. As such, he ordered the artillery to fire at the Austrian positions. As the artillery fired, Hudenburg received orders to charge against the Austrians and hamper their advance. The Prussian right charged straight towards the Austrian left flank. Bacciani ordered his cavalry to launch a counter charge. Both bodies of cavalry heavily damaged each other upon impact. An aggressive and cluttered melee ensued. According to some eyewitness accounts, the rising dust blinded the rear guard of the cavalry. The Prussian cavalry, inferior to the Austrians, endured the brunt of the damage. All the while, Frederick was still frantically deploying his army in the background. He learned from Molwitz that his incredibly disciplined infantry could once again make the difference in the face of adversity. Soon after, Wenzel's cavalry launched a charge against Waldo. Fighting took place on both the eastern and western sides of the battlefield. Among all this chaos, Charles's infantry marched forward towards Chotusitz. Under Dessau, the Prussian infantry launched a counter charge as Frederick's infantry was still not ready for combat. Because the Austrian infantry had already advanced quite a bit, it did not take long for Dessau's infantry to charge into them. Heavily outnumbered, ferocious fighting broke out. Dessau's troops were slowly pushed back into Chotusitz. And when the Austrians reached the outer row of wooden houses, they lit them on fire. The smoke made commanding the armies incredibly challenging. 
As fighting ensued on every front, part of Waldorf's cavalry broke from the melee and charged into the Austrian right flank. Infantry fired volleys at each other as the cavalry battled it out. Finally, Bacciani and Budenbrook's cavalry drifted off to the Austrian left, leaving that infantry flank entirely exposed. It wasn't until 10.30 a.m. that Frederick finished deploying his infantry in a square. The fight had been going on for well over three hours at this point. Sources conflict, but Frederick's army numbered between 14 and 24 battalions. He managed to deploy them all without the Austrians realizing a large infantry body hid behind the mound. Upon Frederick's command, the infantry square marched forward towards the Austrian left flank. The Austrian infantry was incredibly surprised to suddenly see a massive body of infantry march over the mound in a disciplined formation, moving like a wall. Flanking them entirely, they rapidly fired their volleys against the bewildered infantry. Before too long, part of the Austrian infantry began showing cracks. With an unguarded flank and facing fierce resistance from the infantry within Chotusitz, Scholz decided the conditions weren't in his favor. Battling continued between both forces and there wasn't necessarily a side which gained the upper hand, but by the end of the morning, Scholz ordered the general retreat. The Austrians managed to take most of their equipment with them, aside from a few heavy artillery pieces. Several officers reportedly urged Frederick to order a pursuit. However, he refused, considering his cavalry was still in disarray from the fighting and Wenzel's cavalry guarded the Austrian rear. As the Austrians retreated, it slowly became clear to the Prussians they had won the battle. In total, Prussia suffered 4,800 casualties, whereas Austria suffered 6,400, of whom many, if not most, were prisoners. Because Charles was allowed an orderly retreat, the battle of Chotusitz did not prove to be a decisive victory for Prussia. Although, not militarily, because international developments would soon radically play into Frederick's favor. Despite not being a decisive victor, Austria's retreat certainly allowed Frederick to boast of his victory. Letters to friends reveal he exaggerated the number, stating the Prussians lost 1,200 at best, whereas the Austrians lost up to seven times as many men. Charles managed to coordinate a stable retreat, whereas he was able to take up arms against Frederick again in Vienna, where he got the best of Maria Theresa and her advisors. Not to mention the empty treasury. If the Habsburgs wanted to defeat France, they could not have that pesky Frederick taking up resources. As such, they finally caved to another round of diplomatic talks with Frederick. The British presided over the peace talks, agreeing to pay a significant sum for Maria Theresa to cede Silesia. The British had no interest in the balance of power on the European mainland being upset. On June 11th, both parties signed the preliminary peace at Breslau. The final treaty was signed on July 28th in Berlin. The Austrians were only willing to cede Silesia if Frederick became its sovereign duke. The king reportedly replied, I don't give a f about titles, as long as I get the territory. He now left his former allies, the French, Bavarians and Saxons, to fight against the Habsburgs without him. His sudden withdrawal from the war was again a massive blow to his former allies, it was the second time he betrayed them in a very short period. Despite the peace treaty, neither side expected the peace to last indefinitely. Maria Theresa knew that she would have her vengeance once she beat the French. And Frederick understood this all too well. And as soon as the peace was signed, he began restocking his depleted treasury and rebuilding his army. All the while he strengthened his new fortresses in Silesia against a possible invasion. On the early morning of June 4th, 1745, Prince Charles of Lorraine and his 63,000 strong Habsburg army camped between the cities of Pilgamshain, Gundersdorf and Thomas Waldau. He knew the Prussian army commanded personally by Frederick the Great was close by. He was in hostile territory, after all. Then, amidst the darkness of the night, he heard screams, muskets firing and general sounds of battle. Moments later, an out-of-breath infantry soldier ran into the Austrian camp. He shouted, the Prussians are here, they are attacking our Saxon allies nearby Pilgamsheim. Charles began shouting orders at his men, for before he knew it, the battle had already broken out. 
In June 1742, Austria and Prussia concluded the Treaty of Breslau. Subsequently, Frederick remained an outside observer to the fighting for 24 months. He didn't idle during this time. He continued restocking his depleted treasury and rebuilding his army, making several military improvements. Two months after Breslau, the British envoy reported that the king is augmenting his army every day. One of the main improvements was the retraining of Prussian hussars and the heavy cavalry. Because during the First Silesian War, it became painfully obvious this Prussian cavalry performed subpar compared to the well-disciplined infantry. So, already after the Battle of Molwitz, the first battle of that war, Frederick launched a grueling training regiment, which he continued after Breslau. From now on, his hussars weren't used as heavy cavalry anymore. Instead, they performed light cavalry, scouting and acting as flexible units. Additionally, the Prussian artillery received training to make them faster on the battlefield. Frederick's zealous improvements of his army proved necessary, despite it formerly being peacetime. By late 1742, the Habsburgs managed to expel the French from Bohemia. They also occupied Bavaria, beginning a process of incorporating the electorate into the Habsburg Empire. The new year didn't bode well either. The British expanded their financial support to the Habsburgs to actual military aid. George II personally commanded his pragmatic army, scoring a victory against the French at Dettingen. During these months, the Saxons realized they gained nothing by continuing their alliance with France and Bavaria. So instead, in December, they switched sides and joined the Habsburgs. This defection was not in the least caused by Frederick's unfriendly attitude towards his allies, which he often badmouthed in public for anyone to hear. Formerly, the Saxon-Austrian alliance was defensive, but everyone knew it was directed directly against Prussia. Moreover, losing Saxony as an ally posed another geopolitical problem for Prussia. Saxony's elector doubled as the king of Poland-Lithuania. He could now agree to Russian armies trekking through the Commonwealth to invade Prussia from the east. In February 1744, Frederick learned of a secret alliance signed between Austria, Great Britain and Sardinia. Despite him not knowing for sure, he rightly assumed it was directed against him. Similarly to the First Silesian War, he felt cornered and decided not to wait for his enemies to strike first. In June, he signed a renewed offensive alliance with France. His goal was to conquer Bohemia, strengthen the Bavarian Holy Roman Emperor, and seize territories up to the Pardubitz for himself while he was at it. Then in August, he marched south together with 80,000 soldiers, a fully stocked war chest and ample wagons to supply his soldiers. Most of Austria's troops were fighting the French near the Rhine. The poorly garrisoned province didn't stand a chance against the high morale Prussians. Within a week, they captured the city of Prague. One week later, they captured Tabor. But despite having momentum, things went wrong. In Frederick's History of My Own Times, he wrote, No general committed more faults than I did during this campaign. News of the Prussian invasion reached Charles of Lorraine. Contrary to Frederick's expectations, Charles turned his entire army around and returned to Bohemia, with, as Blanding puts it, a speed usually thought to be uncharacteristic of the Austrians. Count Batiani had already been roaming around in Bohemia, augmenting Charles's army with another 18,000 soldiers. Additionally, Another 20,000 Saxons joined in late October. Suddenly, Frederick faced an army of impressive size, nearly matching his own. Not willing to face the Prussians in open battle, a prolonged campaign of recapturing minor Bohemian settlements followed. This continued until December, when Frederick abandoned Prague and prepared for his winter stay in Silesia. The minor skirmishes and constant harassment of supply lines resulted in a war of attrition Frederick's army wasn't prepared for. Letters from Austrian officers reveal up to 30,000 Prussians deserted by the end of 1744. This included officers. They hadn't even fought a real major battle yet and Frederick's army was already crumbling. A renewed anti-Prussian alliance, the expansion of the Saxon army and the death of Holy Roman Emperor Charles VII unnerved Frederick even more. 
Charles's son and heir, Maximilian III Joseph, opened negotiations with Maria Theresa. After a subsequent disastrous defeat for the Bavarians at Pfaffenhofen, the Peace of Füssen marked the end of hostilities between Bavaria and Austria. And things got even worse. Despite the alliance with France still standing, by spring 1745, the kingdom had withdrawn close to all their soldiers to wage war in the Low Countries. Unbeknownst to Frederick, behind his back, the great powers were already discussing the partition of Prussia. They wanted to eradicate the minor player, which they deemed already destroyed. All required was a finishing blow to tip it over the edge. But regardless of his desperate position, Frederick clung on. He left Potsdam for Silesia in March, determined to rebuild his army through recruitment and amnesty for deserters. In the Austrian camp, spirits were high. The Austrians decided to march into Silesia and strike the inevitable final blow against the faltering Prussia. By May, Charles already reached villages a bit to the southwest of Breslau. Augmented by 19,000 Saxon soldiers, he continued his march north. The initial invasion through the mountain passes was straightforward without any notable resistance. However, the Austrians were unaware this was Frederick's plan. A Prussian spy in the Austrian camp informed Charles that Frederick retreated to Breslau for a last stand. But on the contrary, Frederick aimed to lure the Austrians into the Silesian plains for open battle. As soon as they entered Silesia, things changed. Charles referred to Silesia as the most difficult country he ever had to deal with. Frederick quartered his army at a small village on a two-hour march away from Hohenfriedberg, providing significant oversight of the Silesian plains. Austrian correspondence reveals Charles expected to meet 40,000 battered Prussians at best. Instead, nearly 60,000 awaited him. On June 3rd, Frederick received intelligence of the Austrian army marching in the plains south of his position. He ordered his men to leave the campfires burning in tents pitched, deceiving the Austrian scouts. Then they embarked on a night's march towards the Austrians. That evening, the Austrian army camped in a long line spanning from the town of Pilgrimshain to the Strichau Lake. In contrast, the Prussians could not form battle lines in the cluttered terrain south of the Strigau. So first, they used a few bridges around the Strigau to cross the river. Crossing the bridges for an army this size took quite some time. The first to cross was Lieutenant General Dumoulin, tasked with seizing the elevations in front of the Striga. His force numbered some six battalions of infantry and 28 hussar squadrons. Frederick commanded the entire Prussian army himself. Sources conflict on whether he ordered not to take any prisoners preceding the battle. Prince Charles of Lorraine commanded the Habsburg army, with Johann Adolf II, Duke of saxe weisenfels commanding the Saxons. Russia fielded approximately 42,000 infantry, 14,500 heavy cavalry, 2,300 light cavalry, and 192 artillery guns. Light infantry and the characteristic mitre-wearing grenadiers manned the infantry lines, whereas the cavalry consisted of cuirassiers, dragoons, and hussars. The Austrians numbered some 40,000 and the Saxons up to 19,000 troops with 122 artillery pieces. The Austrian cavalry consisted of heavy cuirassiers and light Hungarian hussars. Its infantry consisted of the traditional light infantry and grenadiers. Among them walked regional regiments levied from other areas of the empire, such as the Croatian Pandurs. The Battle of Hohenfriedberg enjoyed a somewhat confusing start. Unbeknownst to Frederick, only the center of the Austrian army had lit their campfires. The Saxons and Austrian cavalry were roaming in the dark. Dumoulin soon discovered that some Saxons had already occupied the elevations. When he arrived, skirmishes broke out. And when news reached Frederick, Dumoulin was already fighting soldiers on the hilltops. He ordered six 24-pounder guns to move onto the hill to support Dumoulin. On the other side of the battlefield, the noise of battle alerted the Saxon and Austrian lines of the Prussian advance. In response, the Saxon and Austrian commanders began deploying parts of their army 
Catching on and realizing he was losing his advantage, Dumoulin decided to bypass the hills and charge straight at the Saxon camp. However, because of the scattered nature of the Austrian and Saxon lines, most of his cavalry found themselves engaged in skirmishes before reaching the Saxon camp. In addition, the Saxon cavalry was deployed further to the west and in front of Pilgrimshain than the Prussians anticipated. The Prussians would be stuck in a pincer movement if things went wrong. Fortunately for Frederick, the Prussians maintained the upper hand against the unprepared Saxons. Before too long, Dumoulin managed to launch a charge against the main Saxon encampment. Weissenfels managed to deploy part of his cavalry and launch a counterattack against the Prussians, but to no avail. As the battle continued, parts of the Saxon infantry managed to deploy and face the Prussians, but they were outnumbered. Their position wasn't strong enough to take on the ever advancing Prussian infantry and cavalry. Scattered, ferocious fighting continued as the Prussians captured many Saxons, including their generals. Meanwhile, in the background, the Prussian infantry under Prince Leopold Max of Anhalt Dessau was finally wrapping up their deployment in the center of the improvised battle line. They began their advance against the Saxon and Austrian line. They did not mind the sporadic bombardment of the Austrian artillery. The Prussian right, facing whatever the Saxons could deploy, met combat first. But they soon littered the battlefield with blood and corpses as they fired their volleys. As battle continued, meanwhile, disaster struck the Prussian rear. Most of the army had crossed the bridges, but before a significant portion of the cavalry crossed, the bridge collapsed. As such, part of the cavalry was left behind the river. It was up to General von Zieten to find a crossing somewhere along the Striga River. This wasn't communicated to the cavalry in the vanguard, however. By 7 a.m. Prussia largely defeated the Saxons. They were not able to resist the Prussian advance on nearly every angle of their front line. Those who survived fled the battlefield. The Austrians were left alone, but they had been deploying and were now ready for battle, albeit too late to help their allies. The Austrian infantry was positioned between Guntersdorf and Thomas Waldau, while the cavalry was positioned between Thomas Waldau and the Strichau River. The Prussian vanguard cavalry contingent was the first to face an Austrian charge on their left. They weren't aware of the bridge in their rear collapsing and the lack of cavalry reinforcements. A ferocious, savage battle ensued. The Prussians were put on the back foot by the numerically superior Austrians. Things did not look good until Zieten managed to find a ford and cross the river. The sudden arrival of more Prussian cavalry shocked the Austrians. Fierce combat ensued, while another cavalry contingent crossed the same ford in the background. These arrived just in time to charge against the Austrian cavalry reinforcements which were charging against the Prussian vanguard. During this cavalry fight, the first Prussian infantry contingents advanced between Thomas Waldau and Guntersdorf. A report from the Prussian general staff details. It is flags flying and drums beating. It is Austrian canister shot and musket fire. It is an awesome, inexorable body of marching Prussians who refuse to disintegrate. Then it is assault by bayonet. The enemy falls back, the villages are seized, the king lowers his spyglass. The battle is won, he states. But they didn't win the battle just yet. As the infantry captured Thomas Waldau, they began firing at the Austrian cavalry from the west, succumbing to the overwhelming numbers and chaos a disorderly rout followed. Charles's army remained, however. Approximately 20,000 Austrian infantry held the fields between Guntersdorf and Thomas Waldau. The Prussian infantry moved against them like a moving wall. The Austrians bitterly contested the ground, giving rise to a terrible fire, not lasting as long as Molwitz, but being much noisier. They appeared unstoppable. The elite Bayreuth Dragoon Regiment filled the gaps as reserves among the Prussian infantry. They would prove crucial in Prussia's victory. It is unclear how their charge materialized, but not having seen any action, the Dragoons were looking for combat. At around 8.15 a.m. they received the order to charge against the Austrians. 
The dragoons rushed between the Prussian gaps straight into the Austrian front line. They inflicted significant damage against the already battered Austrian lines. Within 20 minutes, they captured 2,500 prisoners, 67 colors, and 5 artillery pieces. When the smoke lifted, the troopers were seen to be hewing into a mass of fleeing Austrians. The charge was the final nil in the Austrian coffin. By 9 a.m., the battle ended as Charles ordered the general retreat. Frederick did not commit to pursuing the Austrians despite the incredible success, allowing them to withdraw to Bohemia without harassment. All that remained was a field of ghastly carnage, thousands of dead and dying men and horses. Days later, it became clear the total number of casualties on the Austrian side was close to 13,800, of whom 5,000 prisoners and 3,120 dead. As for Austrian generals, four were killed, four captured and six mortally wounded. The Prussians suffered 4,751 casualties at best. It was an incredible victory for Prussia and Frederick personally. In the aftermath of the battle, Frederick sent letters to all European courts he could think of. He was happy to share his victory with the French King Louis XV and his old mentor, the old de Sauer. He boasted of his victory, stating it was one of the most complete of all times, the likes of which is not seen since Blenheim. This referred to the major battle fought during the War of the Spanish Succession. He exclaimed his Bayreuth dragoons were excellent and if this were Rome, they would have statues in their honor. In contrast, Charles was livid. A letter to Grand Duke Francis details his thoughts in the aftermath of the battle. The misfortune is all the more painful to me that our troops behave like idiots. Forgive this expression, but I am furious. Frederick likely did not pursue the Austrians, convinced Maria Theresa would sue for peace after such a devastating defeat. This did not happen, however. The next few months, Charles received plenty of reinforcements from Italy and Bohemia. It appeared the war was far from over. Maria Theresa wrote letters to George II to assure him she was, in fact, not losing the war. But George got cold feet. On August 26, he concluded the Convention of Hanover with Frederick. Both parties guaranteed each other their territory. And, as was all too common during this war, both sides overlooked to inform their main allies, France and Vienna. Again, Frederick's allies were less than charmed with his conduct. But for now, Frederick enjoyed a brief respite. Finally, he could take a step back, somewhat relax, and count his chickens. However, he began counting before his chickens hatched. And in an ongoing war, that is never a good idea. They had been playing cat and mouse for months. The Prussian army under King Frederick II had been watching the Habsburg army commanded by Prince Charles of Lorraine. They recently set up camp nearby the small village of Burkersdorf. Much to Charles' surprise, the Prussians did not seize notable elevations in the region. Capitalizing on this momentary lack of defenses, Charles knew he would be able to ambush the significantly outsized Prussians. Under the cover of mist and darkness, Austrian and Saxon infantry and cavalry emerged from the dense Königreich forest. They were ready for the battle, even though their adversaries had no idea it was imminent. In the aftermath of the Battle of Hohenfriedberg, Frederick showered his army with praise. In revealing letters, he wrote, the army, cavalry and infantry and hussars have never so distinguished themselves, and how everyone and his brothers fought like lions for their country. He was also optimistic about the results from Hohenfriedberg. To his ministers, he wrote that the victory will bring us good peace and a long rest. He would soon find out that was far from the truth. But he did have a good reason to think Maria Theresa wanted to sue for peace. The Habsburgs suffered defeats in Italy and Flanders. Their allies were growing tired of the war. Meanwhile, Frederick began capitalizing on his success somewhat by advancing onto Königgratz. The Austrians and Saxons retreated to the city south to a solid defensive position. When Frederick set up camp to the north, both encampments could keep an eye on each other. But both Frederick and Prince Charles of Lorraine 
kept it at that and did not engage in any battle. Over summer, Frederick feigned some movements to unnerve Charles, while some generals rooted out the Hungarian hussars behind their lines in Silesia. But being this far south, Frederick's supply lines were stretched. Still, he considered himself an observation army, keeping the Austrians at bay. Throughout the weeks and camped there, he had to send off multiple detachments of soldiers to deal with small Austrian vanguard raiding parties to his north and to his west. The majority of his army, albeit slinking, remained dormant. Prince Ferdinand of Brunswick's letters reveal what he thought of Austria's strategy. They have wounded two of our people with their muskets while hiding like thieves and robbers behind trees and not showing themselves in the open, as becomes proper soldiers. British attempts to broker peace weren't fruitful. They wanted the war on the European mainland to end, but Maria Theresa was livid after the defeat at Hohenfriedberg. She sent Kevenhuller on a diplomatic mission to convince Duke Weissenfels to continue the fight against Prussia. Defeating Prussia remained the top priority. To augment the weakened Austrian army in Bohemia, Maria Theresa sent many reinforcements to Charles. Ten battalions of infantry, a corps of cavalry and two senior commanders. Thanks to these reinforcements, Charles's army soon numbered over 40,000 again. In contrast, Frederick continued sending detachments of soldiers to other regions where reinforcements were required. His main force was slinking fast. By late July, Frederick decided to move. He set up his camp north of the small village of Burkersdorf. Considering himself just an observation army, perhaps that's how he lulled himself into a false sense of security. Letters reveal the king was already planning to return to Berlin in winter to oversee the continued construction of his palace, Sansuki. But international developments hinted at Maria Theresa not being eager to give up the fight, especially because her husband had recently been crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And Charles too had different plans. First, he followed Frederick and set up camp close by, overlooking Burkersdorf in the Prussian camp from a hilltop. Then, after some hesitation, he decided his position was perfect for an ambush. The dense Königreich forest provided cover, while the hills ensured they would have the higher ground. On a foggy and damp early morning, September 30th, 1745, Charles and his army marched through the hilly Königreich forest to reach the flank of the encamped Prussians. He noticed the Prussians had not captured the Granerkoppe Hill, the dominant terrain feature in the region. That night, several Saxon and Austrian vanguard units took up their positions on the hills overseeing Burkersdorf and the Prussian camp. Then, in the early morning hours, the Saxons and the Austrians emerged from the thick woodlands. On the Granerkoppe, Charles positioned 10 battalions of musketeers, 15 companies of grenadiers, 30 squadrons of cuirassiers and dragoons, 15 companies of elite carabiniers, and mounted grenadiers and 16 heavy guns pointed at the Prussians. It was a significant force for sure, but even more soldiers of the main army were positioned to the south of them. As the first Austrians emerged from the woodlands, Prussian guards called on and rushed to headquarters to inform Frederick. As Frederick was holding the 5 a.m. meeting with his generals, he received the news of Charles's army approaching. Frederick immediately jumped on his horse and rode past his army encampment, ordering the drummers and trumpets to sound the alarm. Thoroughly drilled, the Prussian infantry and cavalry rapidly took their positions. Letters from the French envoy after the battle reveal he was surprised at each regiment's speed, discipline and initiative to take their positions without receiving specific orders. Despite this, the Austrian army numbered nearly twice as many soldiers, 40,200 against Prussia's 22,000. Still, the outnumbered Prussians managed to deploy parallel to the Austrians. Frederick didn't have much time to form his plans, but his rough sketch was as follows. He wanted his cavalry on the right to circle the Graner Koppe and flank the Austrians and Saxons on the hill. Meanwhile, the infantry would attack straight against the units on the Graner Koppe. The remainder of the army had to keep the rest of the Austrians and Saxons at bay without engaging in combat. By 8 a.m. the mist mostly dissolved upon which the Austrian artillery on the Graner Koppe 
opened their fire. Simultaneously, Frederick gave the general order to his army to advance against the Austrian positions. The cavalry on the right faced the brunt of the damage. They were the vanguard after all. The artillery scored some significant hits against them, but they managed to push through and emerge on the Austrian left flank. A letter written by a Prussian officer reveals, Our cavalry withstood this ordeal with composure that was all the more admirable when you consider that the enemy bombs frequently landed in the middle of the squadrons, carrying away eight or ten horses at once. After every explosion, the troopers collected themselves, filled the gaps and continued their march with swords in hand. Circumventing the mound, the Prussian squadrons reached a narrow passage leading to an access point of the Ghana Copa. The surprised Austrian cavalry protecting the left did not launch a charge as they remained stationary. The stationary Austrians suffered the brunt of the charging Prussian cavalry. Confused fighting followed, but the Austrians ended up being pushed back into the forest. Seeing their cavalry in disarray, several Austrian infantry units opened fire and localized melees broke out between the infantry and the cavalry. All the while the Prussian infantry marched on. On the Prussian right, the Anhalt Grenadier Regiment, marching directly against the Graner Kuppe, reached the foot of the hill and began climbing it. They were met with extreme resistance, both by artillery and musket fire. Without inflicting any damage against the Austrians, many Prussians fell. Among the casualties was Prince Albert of Brunswick, Frederick's brother-in-law. The Austrians cried out, as Lebe Maria Theresa, they caused mounting deaths among the grenadiers. Their first attack was repelled, with some units losing up to three quarters of their men. The second attack was more successful. This time, the Geist Grenadier Regiment and two regiments of musketeers tried scaling the hill. Thanks to poor positioning by the Austrians on the slope, the artillery was unable to fire at the Prussians. Brief but savage fighting ensued on top of the hill before the Prussians drove the Austrians from it. The Prussian infantry and cavalry holding the other side of Burkersdorf received explicit orders not to engage the Austrians. Instead, they were to remain steady and prevent the Austrian right flank from running to support the left. But as the battle progressed on the Prussian right, the left slowly began moving onto the Austrian lines. It is unknown why they advanced, although it is for certain this was contrary to their official orders. Led by Prince Ferdinand of Brunswick, the Prussians engaged in skirmishes. As time progressed, these skirmishes evolved into a full charge by the Prussian left. The frontal charge against the Austrian infantry led to savage, fierce combat with the cavalry. The Austrian cavalry remained stationary and did not support their infantry through all this. Their lack of initiative allowed the Prussian cavalry to seize 850 Austrian prisoners. Meanwhile, in the background, disaster struck the Prussians, but not in the way they might have expected. Because as the fighting continued on every front, a few Hungarian hussars and Croatian pandours did not feel like fighting. General Nadashti and Colonel Baron von Trenk led their men straight towards the Prussian camp behind the Prussian lines. The lack of able defenders made it easy pickings. They easily killed the few defenders remaining at the camp, and then they ransacked it. They came across Frederick's tent and the war chest. Reportedly, the war chest was filled with up to 80,000 ducats, but they stole all valuables they could find and carry, seizing over 1 million ducats worth of items and belongings. Among the loot was anything from table silver to linen cloth to snuff boxes to even Frederick's flutes and his dog. But although they were plundering the camp in the background, their allies likely could have used them in the battle line instead, because by noon the Austrians and Saxons deteriorated into a rout into the Königreich forest. It appeared the massively outnumbered Prussians managed to fight them on both lines and emerge victorious. Despite this relatively simple battle sequence, the battle was an incredibly bloody and savagely fought affair. The casualties indeed mounted, 
In total, the Prussians suffered 3,911 casualties, of whom 856 died. Frederick's brother-in-law, Duke Albrecht of Brunswick, was among the dead. It is very telling of Frederick's poor marriage quality, for he did not even write his wife a letter of condolence. The Austrian and Saxon casualties numbered 7,444. In the aftermath, Frederick tried to launch a pursuit, but the forest, hills and lack of coordination among his troops prevented any significant follow-up. He later wrote about this. My cavalry came to a halt not far short of the enemy rearguard. I hastened up and shouted, Marsch, vorwärts, drauf. I was greeted with Vivat Victoria and a prolonged chorus of cries. Again I called out, Marsch, and again nobody wanted to move. I lost my temper, I struck out with my stick and fist, and I swore, and I think I know how to swear when I'm angry, but I could do nothing to bring my cavalrymen one step forward. They were drunk with joy and did not hear me. He described the battle as terrible but glorious and the fiercest of the four he had fought. He remarked it had been bloodier than Hohenfriedberg. He also recognized the shrewdness of the Austrians, complimenting Charles on his initially thought-out strategy. It was thanks to Frederick's soldiers' discipline, the thinking on his feet and the courage in the face of aversion that Sor did not become a bloodbath. Oh, and he wrote a letter to his wife after multiple complaints about his cruel behavior. It translates roughly to, he was a brave man. I'm amazed he wasn't killed long ago. The French envoy remarked that at Hohenfriedberg he fought for Silesia, but at Sor he fought for his life. But despite this significant success in battle so far, danger still loomed for Frederick, and it would arrive much sooner than he anticipated. It was a cold and misty early afternoon in December 1745. Light snow fell down on the Prussian army, slowly approaching the small village of Kesselsdorf. They had been chasing their adversaries with great reluctance, echoed by their commander, Frederick the Great's mentor, Prince Leopold I, also known as the Old Sauer. Inside the town, Saxon Field Marshal Frederick Augustus, Count Butowski, was relatively confident awaiting the impending battle. Kesselsdorf was well fortified, his Saxons outnumbered the Prussians, and he knew an even larger army was approaching to reinforce him. Then, the old Dessauer ordered his army forward in a ferocious frontal charge against the fortified positions, despite facing superior numbers. After the Battle of Sor, Frederick made sure his army remained on the battlefield for a few days to show the world the Prussians were in fact victorious. Considering his army was outnumbered nearly 2 to 1, propaganda could quickly turn that around. All the while, Frederick received news of his generals scoring victories against irregulars behind front lines deep in Prussian territory. He also received optimistic dispatches from his envoy negotiating peace with the English. Admittedly, things were looking pretty good for the Prussians, and the king was certain peace was imminent. But it was wishful thinking. Maria Theresa was dead set on the destruction of Prussia and the king personally. Frederick's personal account in the history of my own times reveals the fortitude of the empress degenerated sometimes into obstinacy. She was a woman intoxicated at having recovered the imperial dignity for her descendants. Occupied solely by the smiling prospects of futurity, she thought her grandeur would be degraded should she negotiate with a prince whom she accused of rebellion as with an equal. After Sor, his supplies and army were exhausted to the degree that he marched his army back towards Silesia by early October. Frederick traveled towards Berlin while the rest of his army under the old de Sauer crossed the border on October 19th. Despite his optimism, the war chest was running empty and Frederick actively pursued a new loan from either France or England, whoever was willing to help. On the Austrian side, things were moving as well. The Austrians planned to augment the Saxon army at Dresden before launching a winter campaign directed against Brandenburg and perhaps Berlin. First, they planned to surprise attack the Old Sauer winter quartered in Halle. 
then they would push his army back all the way to Magdeburg. Diverting from waging war in Silesia, an attack against the relatively unprotected Brandenburg and its capital could be a fatal danger for Frederick. If this assault materialized, it would circumvent Frederick's army stationed in Silesia entirely. It would be a disaster. But the Prussian king was very well informed. Upon his arrival in Potsdam, Frederick's sources among the Saxon court informed him the next Austrian attack was to launch from Saxony, directed against Brandenburg. Then news reached him from the Russian court, where the Tsarina publicly announced she would support Saxony if they faced an attack. So he rightly grew more worried. Uncharacteristic as it was for the Austrians, they once again moved fast with their plans. General Nadashti, with 14,000 light infantry, reached Friedland, where he set up camp. Prince Charles was moving on to Reichenberg. Frederick's scouts reported that the Austrian army had already crossed the Saxon frontier in early November. In response, Frederick dispatched his trusted hussar commander von Zieten to hinder the Austrians from linking up with the Saxons at Dresden. Frederick himself, he departed from Potsdam and he ordered the Old de Sauer to redeploy his quartered army. Von Zieten's hussars were the first to engage in serious combat during the winter campaign. On November 23rd, one Saxon infantry regiment and three cavalry regiments defended Katholisch Hennersdorf. Noticing the enemy, Zieten's hussars charged again. After brief but savage fighting, the Saxons retreated, losing over 900 soldiers. Only nine miles away was Prince Charles's army. His lack of supplies, poor morale, and contradictory orders by generals wasn't a good foreboding. Instead of coming to the Saxons' aid, Charles learned the Prussians outnumbered his 18,000-strong army nearly 3 to 1. He ordered the retreat back into Bohemia. It appeared the Austrian offensive was averted before it had ever begun. Charles lost over 5,000 soldiers, whereas Prussia lost no more than 100. Frederick wrote, I have done everything that a general can do with the least spilling of blood and with the greatest results. He wasn't wrong and this did not go unnoticed among the Saxons and Austrians either. Soon after the battle, they received the British envoy carrying Frederick's instructions to offer them a moderate peace. Despite the initial refusal, the Saxon ministers did open negotiations, and the prospects seemed rather promising. Still, Frederick bombarded his mentor, the old de Sauer, with letters ordering him to fall on the Saxons. So as the negotiations were ongoing, De Sauer scored victory after victory, crushing the poorly garrisoned Leipzig and forcing the Saxon field marshal, Frederick Augustus, Count Rutowski, to fall back nearby Dresden. It has to be said that the De Sauer completed these tasks with an unhealthy dose of aversion. Surviving correspondence between Frederick and him reveal he did not shy away from giving his opinion on the forced marches and battles during midwinter. His men were tired and he refused to carry out Frederick's order several times. Some correspondence implies that if things had gone differently, de Sauer would be a suitable candidate for court-martialing. But unbeknownst to both commanders, in the background, peace negotiations were ongoing and looked more optimistic by the day. Still, following the king's orders, de Sauer advanced onto Dresden. Finally, on December 15, both armies met near Kesselsdorf, slightly south of the capital. It was a cold and misty afternoon with light snow. The old de Sauer and his army marched onto Dresden from the west, when scouts informed him of Field Marshal Rutowski and the Saxon main army holding the ground from Kesselsdorf to Ockerwitz. The old Prussian commander, 69 years old at this point, commanded a 32,000 strong Prussian army. Field Marshal Rutowski commanded a 35,000 strong Saxon army. Rutowski's Saxons were positioned along the Schonerbach River. The Austrian contingent under General Grüne was positioned on the outskirts of Ockerwitz towards the Elbe River. Rutowski ordered his infantry in Kesselsdorf to fortify the town with solid defenses and artillery. In the early afternoon, the old de Sauer's army approached Kesselsdorf. His army spanned from the southwest all the way to the north, opposite of the Saxon right flank. As the entire army approached, 
Dessauer ordered his infantry in the south to launch a frontal charge against the heavily fortified Kesselsdorf. Among the vanguard, charging towards the city, were his and Holt grenadiers. Thanks to the strategic positioning of the artillery and the general fortifications, the infantry charge against Kesselsdorf experienced fierce resistance. The Prussian soldiers marched on despite continuous artillery shots fired against them. They suffered enormous casualties. As the infantry continued their charge, the Prussian infantry to their north and the cavalry on their left flank began their assault as well. However, the banks of the Schonerbach River were muddy and the terrain was difficult to cross in general. Consequently, Saxon artillery fired against the Prussian infantry and cavalry crossing the stream. Certain locations saw skirmishes erupt, but large-scale battles did not ensue, for both parties were too hindered by the terrain. Meanwhile, to the south of Kesselsdorf, the first infantry wave eventually had to retreat despite their discipline. The charge simply was not sustainable. They suffered hefty losses. Things were not looking good for the Prussians, and the Saxons also knew it. With sky-high morale and confident they would deal the Prussians a decisive blow, the Saxon defenders of Kesselsdorf leapt over their defensive positions to give chase against the Prussians. It is uncertain if this was a direct order or if it was a spur-of-the-moment decision by the Saxon infantry. What is for sure is that once they left their defensive positions, the Saxons were exposed to whatever Prussian soldiers remained outside Kesselsdorf. Consequently, a 2nd Grenadier regiment launched a counterattack. The Prussians clashed heavily with the Saxons. Brief, heavy combat broke out, but the Prussian iron discipline proved superior. Understanding their mistake by leaving their fortified positions, the Saxon lines quickly deteriorated into an uncoordinated rout. The Saxon left flank suffered the brunt of the damage, leading to them being pushed north towards the center lines. Despite only minor skirmishes happening throughout the entire center line, the Prussians had a minor advantage there too. When the Saxon defenders in the center line learned of their retreating comrades to the south, the center line began showing cracks as well. Because of the lack of aid from the Austrian general Grüne, we can safely assume the lines of communication between the Saxons and the Austrians were subpar. Shortly before dark, the entire center line deteriorated into a rout. Butowski had lost central command for a while already and could do nothing but leave his position. As for the Austrians, their only contribution was joining the Saxons in flight once they noticed their positions breaking. The Saxons and Austrians fled all the way to Prince Charles's army. Dessauer decided not to pursue them but instead sent word to the king of his victory. In total, the Prussians lost 3,500 men, of whom a thousand died. The Saxons suffered 3,000 fatalities. 5,000 more were captured. Relatively speaking, it was quite an expensive victory for the already thinned out Prussian army, but international developments would soon mitigate these losses and turn the modest victory into a great one. This was an incredible victory for Prussia despite the casualties. Still, in a letter, Frederick made the sober remark that it was better to suffer the dead at Dresden than at Berlin. Fate had it that the victory was unnecessary. As the Sauer and Rutowski were fighting the battle, unbeknownst to them, Frederick received word from the British envoy. King Augustus, doubling as Saxony's elector, agreed to the proposed peace terms. The Austrian envoy, too, supposedly agreed to these terms. If anything, the victory at Dresden strengthened Prussia's position. Frederick obviously was delighted, and when both armies linked up near Dresden two days later, Frederick dismounted and embraced his old mentor. The bad blood had been forgotten. The following day, after the surrender of the small Saxon garrison defending Dresden, the Prussians victoriously rode into the Saxon capital. Maria Theresa could do nothing but concede a military solution wasn't viable. On Christmas Day in 1745, both parties signed the Peace of Dresden. It ended the Second Silesian War. Maria Theresa confirmed the contents of the Treaty of Breslau, acknowledging Prussia's sovereignty over Silesia and the Duchy of Graz. In return, Frederick guaranteed the Habsburg lands and agreed to vote for Francis, Maria Theresa's husband, as Holy Roman Emperor. Saxony had to pay Prussia one million thalers as war indemnity. 
And for those who wonder, Frederick's dog, stolen at the Battle of Sor, was returned to him preceding the final battle. In his history of my own times, Frederick himself wrote that the war had cost him 8 million thalers. By the time he signed the peace, he was left with just 15,000 in his treasury. Despite this, upon his return to Berlin, he was given a hero's welcome and hailed as Frederick the Great for the first time. The young king likely played a vital role in the propaganda campaign resulting in this flattering sobriquet. The War of the Austrian Succession ended up lasting three more years. Frederick's ally France was largely left to fight it out on its own. As it became more or less customary, the French did not find out about Frederick's peace until after he actually signed it. Just like before, in November 1741 and the Treaty of Breslau in 1742, they were livid. For now, they were stuck in a war of which the outcome was still uncertain. But whether they would emerge victoriously or not, they wouldn't forget Frederick's betrayals. In the 1740s, many European states were astonished at the outcome of the two Silesian wars. Both in terms of speed and success, the at best minor principality Prussia took on Austria, the Holy Roman Empire's strongest dynasty and one of the critical great powers of the European continent. Prussia was one of the many German principalities. It wasn't the wealthiest, it certainly didn't have the most resources, and its disjointed territories did not hint at it becoming more than a historical footnote of the Holy Roman Empire. The success also made it a prime target for its enemies, who had not forgotten nor forgiven Prussia, and especially its King Frederick's conduct. He began a war without a legitimate cause, abandoned alliances whenever he saw fit, and betrayed the Habsburg monarchy several times, suing for peace, but not adhering to it whatsoever. At any rate, he was a gambler, Fortunately for him, in case of Silesia, it had paid off. And through this conduct, Prussia defeated Austria. However, Prussia's victory wasn't necessarily the result of great strategic insight and resolute leadership. At least not initially. Frederick's father, Frederick William, the soldier king, spent his entire reign augmenting and expanding the Prussian infantry. When he passed away in 1740, his son inherited a relatively enormous, well-disciplined and well-drilled army. In battle, the Prussian infantry proved superior to the Austrians and Saxons. Their skill compensated for Frederick's initial lackluster command of battle. For example, during the April 1741 Battle of Molwitz, the Prussians were put on the back foot and Frederick's general, von Schwerin, recommended the king to flee the battlefield, which he promptly did. It was only thanks to the relentless advance of the Prussian infantry in the face of adversity that the Prussians came out on top. One year later, at the May 1742 Battle of Chotositz, this pattern repeated itself, although credit to Frederick is due that he undoubtedly learned from his mistakes. To begin with, it confirmed the suspicions that Prussian cavalry wasn't able to compete with the Austrians. It was only thanks to the flexibility and the discipline of, once again, Prussia's infantry that the battle was turned and they emerged victoriously. By the time the Second Silesian War erupted at Hohenfriedberg, Frederick proved himself an able strategist. He adapted to ever-changing circumstances, and once again his infantry secured the victory for Prussia. What made Prussia's victory all the more impressive was that Prussia's fellow principalities Bavaria and Saxony fared much worse during and in the aftermath of the war. Bavaria's elector had to flee his electorate when the Austrians invaded. The Saxons changed sides in the middle of the war, only to lose to the Prussians at Hohenfriedberg, Sor, and Kesselsdorf. Three years after Prussia made peace, financial exhaustion led to other participants of the war to sign the Treaty of Aix la Chapelle, ending the war. In it, it confirmed Prussia's sovereignty over Silesia. Well, sort of. Despite the acquisition, Prussia's adversaries were already plotting how to seize Silesia and tear up the entire kingdom, which had humiliated both Austria and Prussia's wronged allies. Austria felt especially vicious. Frankly, the eight-year-long peace that followed was nothing more than a truce. Destroying Prussia became the foremost objective of the Habsburg monarchy. This 
anger is understandable if we consider Silesia's qualities. Thanks to its well-developed agricultural and textile industrial infrastructure, its abundance of resources and minerals, and its size, nearly one-third of the size of England, it was a significant loss. Relatively speaking, Silesia contributed the most to the Habsburg monarchy's coffers, around 25%. Its 1.1 million inhabitants added a third to Prussia's population, and thus conscriptable men. Under Prussian rule, the province contributed nearly half of the crown's revenue, not to mention its strategic geographic value. Its loss caused the Habsburg monarchy to lose its influence in northern Germany, while Prussia gained a springboard to Prague and even Vienna. In addition, the many fortresses were robust and welcome frontier defense. I won't go into too much detail, but the sources in the description offer a very detailed account of Austria's reorientation of foreign policy in the aftermath of the war. Christopher Clark provides a neat overview. In short, championed by the youngest cabinet member, Count Kaunitz, rapprochement with France became official Habsburg policy. Kaunitz argued that despite Austria's traditional enemy being France and its traditional ally being Britain, this should be reversed now that it became clear the objectives of Britain as a maritime power were too distinct from continental Austria's. Additionally, the multilingual nature of the empire was a weakness, and the Habsburgs should focus on the German land. Kaunitz's proposal was twice as long as the proposals of the other ministers combined, and he was on his own. The proposal was controversial, bold and radical, but Maria Theresa decided to embrace it nonetheless. Kaunitz rose through the ranks during the following years, becoming Austria's ambassador to Versailles and becoming the Habsburg monarchy's state chancellor in 1753. He preoccupied himself with smoothing things over with their traditional enemy, France. And he did, successfully. The Habsburg monarchy also found a sympathetic Russia, whose Tsarina Elizabeth and her advisors were alarmed by the sudden rapid rise of Prussia. Especially its potential expansion in the Baltic, using the Duchy of Prussia as a springboard, wasn't sitting well with them. Two years before the war ended, Russia had already signed an alliance with Austria explicitly mentioning how the Hohenzollern monarchy was to be partitioned in case of its defeat. King August of Poland, doubling as Saxony's elector, also continued his alliance with Austria. Sweden too eagerly joined the Habsburgs, for they stood to regain Pomerania in northern Germany. Militarily, Austria enjoyed multiple reforms. The most striking and essential for the Seven Years' War is its reform in artillery. The Austrian prince Joseph Wendel von Liechtenstein personally financed a radical improvement of the artillery wing of the Habsburg army. When they saw combat again in 1756, their adversaries definitely noticed it was not the same Austrian army they faced during the Silesian Wars. Frederick knew and understood there were forces at play he had no control over. Sure, he had won, but his victory arguably landed him in more dangerous waters. Before the ink of the peace treaty was dry, he already began preparing for the next war, dryly remarking, the ant amasses in summer what it consumes in winter. He spent the 11 years between the Second Silesian War and the Seven Years' War outbreak improving his army. This already began between the First and the Second Silesian War, and during peacetime, Prussia's regiments continued their brutal training regimen. Prussia's autumn war games were conducted in Silesia because Frederick and his advisors expected a future war to take place there. Prussian cavalry, artillery and technical arms received most of the improvements, for the condition of the infantry was still among the greatest in Europe. Frederick knew this and also became a little bit complacent, he mistakenly believed whenever his infantry advanced, he would emerge victoriously, but reality would soon prove him wrong. Besides this, peacetime saw another radical shift in Prussia's military. Frederick drilled his cavalry so that its quality became unparalleled in Europe. He did this the same way his father had prepared the infantry. Soldiers had to ride their horses daily, even in peacetime. It was a simple recipe, drilling, drilling, and even more drilling, but it worked. By the 1750s, his dragoons and cuirassier regiments could gallop and charge with the horses touching each other. In addition, cavalry commanders knew Frederick would have them court-martialed 
if they suffered an enemy's charge while stationary. Lastly, commanders were at liberty to direct their attacks and maneuvers without awaiting official orders, as long as they thought an opportunity presented itself. Frederick embarked on an energetic diplomatic mission to guarantee alliances during the interbellum. His main priority was to appease Russia, remarking to his envoy in St. Petersburg that there is nothing in the world I would not do to maintain in perpetuity harmonious relations with the Russian Empire. Unfortunately for Frederick, the Prussophobe Vice-Chancellor Count Alexei Bestuzhev blocked every attempt at reconciliation. When Tsarina Elizabeth promoted him to Grand Chancellor, the situation worsened. Up until the outbreak of the war, there was no point in attempting to conclude an alliance with Russia. His Vienna intelligence reports detailing Kaunitz's plans didn't offer much hope either, but stubborn as he was, and as we will see, still lacking tact as a statesman, he let his personal biases get the best of him. Frederick was convinced of the natural hostility between the French Bourbons on one side and the Austrian Habsburgs on the other, until far too late. There was no way an anti-Prussian alliance could ever materialize between these two states. His French ally would support him without a doubt, despite his defections during the Silesian Wars. Meanwhile, around the world things were heating up between England and France. Their skirmishes in the New World, India, Africa and the Caribbean caused massive shockwaves which continental Europe would feel for years to come. France saw its colony Canada threatened by the British. By 1754, war seemed inevitable to both parties. Although Britain was a maritime power with its eyes set on the New World, King George II had significant interests in continental Europe. His homeland, the Principality of Hanover, was in potential danger against France and its traditional but unreliable ally Prussia. George figured, to prevent France from invading Hanover, he required a distraction. Austria and Russia were critical in this. But negotiations between Austria and Britain collapsed. The interests of both great powers and traditional allies were too diverse. Maritime Britain looked at the New World, and continental Austria had no real interest outside of Europe. Diplomatic changes were slow to materialize, but this period, the diplomatic revolution, saw most great and minor powers realize their interests diverged too much from their traditional allies. Alliances, sometimes centuries old, were beginning to show cracks or fall through. Russia was still a potential ally for the British. Their envoy to St. Petersburg offered Elizabeth to finance their army and fleet as long as they promised to keep the Duchy of Prussia preoccupied. The 1755 Treaty of St. Petersburg put this agreement into writing. Britain agreed to subsidize Russia with £100,000 if they promised to hold an army of 50,000 and 50 galleys stationed on its western frontier. In case of an outbreak of war, Britain would pay an extra £400,000. Elizabeth was slow to ratify this treaty, however. It is an understatement to say Frederick was unnerved when he learned of these plans. Having always respected Russia's strength, he embarked on the diplomatic route to assure George he would leave Hanover alone. Anglo-Prussian relations improved in the years preceding this, and in part thanks to the Tsarina's slow ratification, George was receptive to a defensive agreement with Prussia. At the January 1756 Convention of Westminster, Prussia and England signed a defensive alliance. Despite the treaty not necessarily being a direct threat against any other power, it led to an all-out war over the entire world. It doesn't take a geopolitical expert to see this hastily concluded treaty was a monumental mistake on Frederick's part. The Russians were angry as the British suddenly halted their subsidies thanks to the conduct of the very state the subsidies were directed against. Enraged, the Tsarina eagerly searched for any alliance against Prussia. Betraying the French for so many times and even joining a pact against his former ally, well, it was considered a cardinal sin. The anti-Prussian sentiment at Versailles increased and Louis XV refused to listen to anyone who did not hate Prussia and its king. With the Habsburg attempts to reconcile their relationship with Versailles, Frederick's acts were the final push France required to consider Austria as its ally. 
things moved very rapidly. Three months after signing the Treaty of Westminster, France signed a defensive alliance with Austria. Both parties promised each other significant military aid in the event of an attack against one of them. Russia obviously learned of this and happily joined them, becoming the leading proponent of an all-out war. Prussia was, quite literally, encircled. Now, the Triple Alliance of Austria, France and Russia agreed that they would reduce Prussia to the Margravate of Brandenburg. They would share the rest of the territory among them. These aims weren't too ambitious considering it was three great powers facing a much smaller, not real great power. Britain's theatres of war were on the other side of the world and there lay Frederick's Prussia, isolated in Central Europe, surrounded by three enemies. And each of these enemies had a bigger army than Prussia had. War was returning to Europe and everyone knew it. This video is an epilogue on my series on the first two Silesian wars. After these events, the Seven Years War broke out, which will be covered from the Battle of Lobositz all the way to the end. Thank you very much for watching this video and the entire documentary about the first two Silesian Wars. I'm really looking forward on covering the Seven Years War in detail. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, please consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain early access to my videos, your name will be at the end of the video and you will be supporting my work and ensuring that I can continue with these feature-length documentaries and in-detail battle analysis. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.